afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Center for Health Equities Health Equity Jam session today, uh, December 1st, 2021. Um, we're back early, uh, really, because we know it's going to become busy uh, during the holiday season. So we wanted to make sure that uh, you didn't get, you didn't miss another wonderful Health Equity Jam session. And we have a very exciting speaker today to joining us. And so we're going to introduce him more formally first, and then we'll go into our traditional health equity jam session introduction, which should be fun. Now, I really wanted to like keep the music going because I was having so much fun and enjoying it. Um, and so if you were like me and really enjoying the music, then stick around because you'll learn more about who that was, and um, and then also maybe you get to enjoy a little bit more of it later today too. So anyway, good to see everyone. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving and didn't eat too much. As you know, we are all very conscious about cardiovascular health here, um, but we eat too. We actually do a lot of eating, <laughs> um, but we just exercise and do a lot of other healthy things too to make sure that we we stay healthy. So anyway, okay, so let's get to business. Um, I wanna introduce you to our speaker for today. Uh, he's Dr. Seth Martin, who is an associate professor in the Division of Cardiology here at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he is a dedicated clinician and clinical educator, as well as a researcher. Um, he's an attending physician at, at Johns Hopkins Hospital, also serves as teaching faculty uh, in the Janeway firm a faculty member in the Chikaroni Center for the Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease, uh, directing the Advanced Lipid Disorders Program and the Digital Health Innovations Lab. And so I actually first met Seth a few years ago when we were just starting the Rich Life Project and we were looking for experts to help us train our care managers and community health workers. And he came highly recommended by Dr. Roger Blumenthal as an expert in lipid disorders and gave an excellent lecture on uh, treatment of hypercholesterolemia to our care managers and community health workers. But a lot has happened since then uh, to build our uh, collaborations. Um, so he, uh, since 2020, has served as co-director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Mobile Technologies to achieve equity in cardiovascular health uh, called MTEC. It's a funded by the AHA and is an AHA strategically focused research network, uh, Health Technology and Innovation Center. So he has collaborated with the Center for Health Equity on, on that particular project. Um, and that project is developing tailored mobile technologies for stroke diagnosis and virtual cardiovascular rehab guided by human-centered design methodology. Now, Seth is also a collaborating investigator in the linked BP study, which is part of the Restore Network, also funded by AHA and also uh, uh, in collaboration with the Center for Health Equity. So there are several faculty members in the Center for Health Equity who all already work with Dr. Martin. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing we know about him and uh, really applaud about him is that he's also an excellent mentor. He's been recognized for uh, mentorship with the Fred Brancati Mentorship Award from the Department of Medicine. And so we here at the Center for Health Equity value mentoring and training very highly. So we're happy to, to hear that. So now for the, the fun part, all of this was fun, of course. And, uh, and Seth is looking very sharp today, by the way, if you haven't noticed yet. Um, so anyway, uh, I was, uh, was there a memo about everybody looking nice today that I missed? <laughs> yeah, yes, there was a memo. There was a memo. <laughs> Actually, I think we some of us had other things we were doing today that required us to dress up a little bit. But but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> and uh, so so let's hear more about Seth. I'm, we're going to have some fun facts. And um, so how many people know, like, what do the Center for Health Equity and Dr. Seth Martin have in common in terms of their relationship to being at Johns Hopkins? What do they have in common? 
Let's see if we have some good guesses. That's a hard question, I know. Oh, gosh, I guess I made it so easy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I made it too easy. You guys are all guessing right. Yes. Seth Martin came to Johns Hopkins uh, approximately 10, 11 years ago. That's when the Center for Health Equity was founded. So uh, they are brothers and sisters. <laughs> so um, we're going to ask another question. There's a faculty member in the Center for Health Equity who shares a common, a love of a common sport with Dr. Martin. So first you're gonna have to guess what the sport is and then guess who the Center for Health Equity faculty member is. And you can think very broadly in terms of sport. Tennis, Dr. Cruz. Well, that wasn't a bad guess. That was pretty close. It's you're warm. I don't know if that helps helps anymore. You're warm when you say tennis. <laughs> Racquetball, huh? That's warm too. Squash, that's also warm. I don't know what pickleball is, but so. But I'm yeah, no, I must be. What's pickleball? I think pickleball is something some of the older people play. It's with a paddle and a ball and that you hit over the tennis net. Okay, all right. You're on the knees, I think. Young, <laughs> people, young people play it too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, well, it's probably because I'm so young that I don't know what pickleball is. Right. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, anyway, we have a correct answer from Malaysia. It's ping pong, ping pong, mm. yay. All right, so who is the other faculty member who loves to play ping pong? Faculty member from the Center for Health Equity. Some guesses. I actually have a ping pong table, but I and I, but I'm not going to say that. You know, I like ping pong too, but it's not me. <laughs> Well, I'll give some, I'll give another clue. Um, this faculty member also has a couple of other things in common with Dr. Martin in terms of research interests. Ah, uh, there we go. The answer is ding, Dr. Yvonne Commodore Menza. Apparently she's an avid lover of ping pong too. So I've got to get both of them over here and helping me, you know, beef up on my skills that I tried to sharpen up on during the pandemic. You know, I don't know how many people went out there and bought games to play in the house during the pandemic, but I was one of those people. <laughs> All right, so let's see. So we got, we may have one more fun fact before we go on to the presentation. Let's see, what do we have? Uh, we actually, we have two more fun facts. Uh, one of them is about, uh, hmm. Let's see, how can I frame this? Why do you think Dr. Martin is focused on technology in his research? Do you think he's like a real, tech whiz? Does he seem like a techie kind of guy? Like any guesses around that? How techie is Dr. Martin? Very techie. Yeah. So let me tell you something. I'm married to an IT guy. One of the reasons I married him was because I thought he would help me with all my IT problems. But he doesn't because he doesn't like any of my IT stuff. He's more, it, my stuff is boring to him. So, um, so what my husband and Seth Martin have in common is that apparently, even though they do work in the technology space, 
they're not very techie people. <laughs> um, we learned that actually uh, Seth actually often goes for coaching from his brother and from his engineering colleagues to deal with technology issues and that he really uses his sort of lack of techiness to identify more with the patients for whom he's actually developing these uh, technologies. So I think that's, that's great. I think that's really cool. Yep, so somebody's making sure to let me know that uh, tech users and tech analyses are very different. And uh, Casey Overby Taylor is telling us that he actually does the tech innovation. So yeah, he, you don't have to be, you can just create new technology that actually works for like normal people, you know? Okay, so the last thing is just to guess what uh, Dr. Martin's favorite um, artist is. Who were we listening to at the beginning of this session? And who do we want to hear more from? Who was the artist? And no Googling. So many people love to Google during the fun facts. You know, we've got to stop that. So, hey, so Allison Trainer and Yvonne Commodore Menza said they recognized Ed Sheeran's voice. And um, I think I probably would have recognized it, but. Uh, but it helped that I actually knew it ahead of time. So, so yeah, so anyway, that's it for the fun facts. And um, I'm going to turn over to our wonderful speaker uh, for today. And thank you again for joining us for being here today. We're looking forward to hearing all about your fabulously innovative research. Thank you very, very much, Lisa. I mean, I, this is the warmest welcome introduction I've ever had. I think you, you do all do it in such an innovative way. I, I love it. So thank you so much. I'm glad people enjoyed the music, Ed Sheeran. Um, yeah, he's his music sounds good, but I just love the fact that he's kind of like so authentic. He writes all his own songs. He when he even live, he sounds amazing. It's just so, so authentic. He's so talented. And I, I, I you know, I can say I did like become a fan of his like early on before he got like really massive in the US, but obviously he's such a big, big hit now. I've been to a couple of his concerts with my wife and uh, looking forward when things are better in this world from a virus standpoint to be able to go again. So glad people like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. I do have quite a bit of slides. I'm gonna, go through them, um, you know, probably at a decent pace here, just to make time, sure there's time for discussion. Like, what would be the optimal amount of time that I kind of like finish up and leave at the end? Well, I think we're pretty flexible. We okay. do have, we have until 4.30, so, yeah. but we usually like to have a, a, a good amount of time yeah. for interaction. So if you could try to be done around four, um, that would be great. Okay. We're not, but we're not again. We're okay. flexible. I like that. Thank you so much. I'll I'll try to aim uh, for around four. Um, so so yeah, I mean, you know the title, the title of the talk. And um, again, I'm just so thankful to be here. Thanks. You know, it's great to have familiar faces and names here as well as to be connecting with with new folks. And I, I mean, teamwork is just so central to innovation. And um, I just cherish these opportunities to to connect more and, and brainstorm about um, the future. Uh, I do have a lot of disclosures. I wanna be very transparent about that. There's a patent that Hopkins filed on an LDL method that I am gonna to touch upon. I'm a co-founder of Corey Health along with Francoise Marvel and, and Hopkins does have equity stake in this company. There's been philanthropic support that we benefited from and, and then all these research support, including industry, as well as consulting that I've done for these, these companies. So just to be very transparent about that, but ultimately, I think these kind of collaborations are critical to moving the world forward. I'm especially thankful kind of in, in the spirit of, I guess I'm your first jam session since Thanksgiving. And in the spirit of, of being grateful, um, I just wanted to start by, by thanking you. Uh, Lisa, you did mentioned Rich Life. I had the opportunity to play a very small role there, giving uh, the talk related to lipid management. And it's just been great to have increasing collaborations since then. Um, the M Health interest group is something 
that um, I started, I'm going to touch on this a little bit later, kind of in my mobile health journey, um, but you all were gracious enough when La Princess Brewer was visiting to give a jam session to allow her to also visit us at the M Health Interest Group. And, and that's just been a great group to bring together different disciplines and, and to learn from each other. M Tech, I'm going to get into this quite a bit, our, our new HA funded center. Um, I'm thankful to you, uh, Dr. Lisa Cooper, for serving as the steering committee chair for our center. I'm thankful for Yvonne Commodore Mensa for playing such a critical role, for Nancy Malello collaborating with Nino on human center design. I'm going to get more into this in the coming uh, time. Of course, you, you are all well aware of the linked BP, and I just want to thank you for involving uh, me in that effort. And I'm going to touch on this later that um, some of the, the um, collaboration Yvonne and I have on the HA statistical document and some of the latest thinking around health equity there and how we're going to make some changes to that document to, to um, address health equity. And I have some dot, dots, dots, because I hope this is just the start of much more to come. So to give you a little sense of my journey, um, you know, I like I did not come into this to research. I didn't kind of come into my training with a health equity focus. This is something that I still consider myself very much kind of a novice, and I'm thankful to be learning from all of you. I, I came into this kind of with the lens of medicine, of then training in cardiology and then lip, lipidology. And over time, I then developed this interest in technology, mobile health technology, and this has kind of led me to, to health equity and to look at my research, to look at the world now with, with a health equity lens. And I want to just sort of take you through some of the journey here um, and, and, and a lot of the research that we've done. And some of this lipids research, I think, does highlight disparities that need to be addressed and also we did find that mobile technology was one of the ways to disseminate our, our, our work um, throughout the globe and, and, to, um, and to challenge the status quo. So to get into sort of the start, this is, this is sort of the shorter chapter of things, but I, being a, a clinician, I wanna just bring this back to the clinic for a moment, starting with a case of TA, who's a 48 year old, uh, African-American woman who I met at Johns Hopkins Hospital when she was there on the cardiology service. Um, she had had, a, and sorry for the technical kind of lingo here for people that aren't necessarily clinicians, but MI basically is heart attack and she had a single vessel then stent um, five years ago. So she basically had her artery open with a stent. And then I, I unfortunately hadn't met her back then. I'm meeting her now at the time that she's now having a recurrent heart attack, and unfortunately, her heart disease has progressed to multi-vessel disease requiring bypass surgery. So she had to have her chest opened up and have bypass vessels put in. And what I was struck by is if you look back at her history, she had this history of hyperlipidemia, and many people have high cholesterol, uh, and she had these other risk factors, but her high cholesterol was not your run-of-the-mill high cholesterol. She had strikingly high cholesterol. Her before she was on treatment, her LDL cholesterol, bad cholesterol was 304. The average American has an LDL of 110 or so. So, and the average American is not particularly healthy. So if you look at her family history, she had this striking um, family history with a father having a heart attack at age 57 and high cholesterol, brother dying early of a heart attack with hyper, hyperlipidemia and a paternal uncle as well. And so on her physical exam, when I examined her there in the hospital, I noticed in her eyes, she had corneal arcus and her tendons, she had thickened Achilles tendons. And this is very uh, diagnostic of a condition called familial hypercholesterolemia. She was born with genes that are driving up her cholesterol. So she did get started um, on high doses of cholesterol therapy, a statin and then azetamide. She actually went to cardiac rehab, which is something that I'm going to get into a lot of how we're going to scale up access to that through technology. Even then, her cholesterol still was not where it needed to be. And so luckily, she was able to access our lipid clinic. She got started on this advanced lipid therapy that we're lucky to now have ever since 2015, PCSK9 inhibitors. But 
although she's doing well now, I'm just struck at how much of a failure there was to really address this early on in her life. And this is such a huge problem in our country. It's really a major public health problem. The fact that familial hypercholesterolemia is present in one in 250 people. So that's over a million people in our country, over 10 million people around the world. And it's autosomal dominant. So if, if, you, if a parent has it and they have two children, chances are one of those two children have this. And there's a 20 fold increased risk Generally, guidelines focus on the phenotype so that if it's if your cluster, LDL cholesterol is 190 or more, then you have this phenotype. Um, few clinics do genetic testing like we do at Hopkins to, to further confirm the diagnosis, but this is severely underdiagnosed and undertreated. It's thought that only about 10% of cases are diagnosed. And these are data from the Brigham that show that if you're a young person coming in with an MI and you have a family history and the high cholesterol, six out of 10 actually have familial hypercholesterolemia. And then even after diagnosis, they still get poor treatment. Only 43% are getting a good LDL reduction at a year after their MI. So there's this major disparities. And our clinic at Hopkins happens to be part of this national registry with over 3,000 adults with familial hypercholesterolemia. And this is one of the papers that I was involved with where we identified disparities in sex, by sex and race ethnicity. Women were, let, so things are bad to start with. And then women were even less likely to men to achieve LDL goals and receive statins. Asian and black patients were 40 to 50% less likely to achieve LDL goals than white patient. So it's a bad situation to start with. And then there's further disparities. And so part of the reason I bring this up as well is because it does tie in with some of our research related to LDL cholesterol. So ultimately, LDL cholesterol is the most evidence-based metric that we have to intervene in someone who has fam familial hypercholesterolemia or has cardiovascular risk and to basically prevent the need for stents and hospitalizations and bypass surgery. And it's really just been central in the clinical trials, guidelines, and, and daily practice. I took the latest guidelines and made a word cloud of them, like using all the words from all the whole guidelines and LDL stands out kind of not surprisingly front and center there. And it's, it's critical, like in the case of TA, it's critical to decision-making. So we're starting in somebody who's had a heart attack, high intensity statin therapy. We add azetamide. This is in addition to, of course, um, doing the best that you can to optimize your diet and exercise. And then now we're fortunate to have PCSK9 inhibitors and the decisions to use these additional therapies, which are really critical in familial hypercholesterolemia really hinges on, on, on whether your LDL cholesterol is 70 or more. Yet we've shown in a very large database uh, that when you use the classical equation to calculate LDL cholesterol, there's a strong tendency to underestimate LDL cholesterol levels. And so what this means is that, that we're now using in modern times an equation not really in the way that it was intended to be used. So when I was a, a cardiology fellow, I got interested in this topic and looked back at um, Dr. Friedwald's original paper from the NIH in the 1970s. And here he is pictured with his equation because his paper, uh, he was being celebrated because his paper is one of the most um, cited in the history of medicine. And when what he, they said in their original paper was that simple division of plasma triglycerides by five does not give a very accurate estimate of VLDL. So they, they already acknowledged this back in the 1970s, yet um, we, they tolerated it because at that time we didn't even have statins or any of these other drugs. So people's cholesterol levels tended to be high and this part of the equation was a relatively smaller proportion. But the problem is it tends to overestimate this VLDL component. So then when that gets subtracted, you underestimate LDL cholesterol. And so what we've shown in our research is that this 
really is leading to missed opportunities for prevention. So of patients who have a Friedwald calculated LDL of less than 70, one in five of them actually have a, a LDL that's above that. It's, it's not truly at the guideline goal. And if you're looking at people with high triglyceride levels, which is something that's very common in patients with diabetes and so forth, two out of three of those people actually who are told by the lab that their LDL is less than 70, it's not truly less than 70. And I could get into a whole discussion of why we don't directly measure this at scale. There's chemical assays that are not uh, well validated and don't work very well. The, the, the research method of ultracentrifugation can't be scaled in an efficient way to clinical practice. So there's this need to calculate LDL. And so what we, we ended up coming up with a solution that's been validated by studies around the world and now has been integrated into the lab IT system at Hopkins, at Quest Diagnostics. But many patients are still going to LabCorp where the NIH now uses a, a different calculation that still underestimates LDL to some extent, just not as bad as the old Friedwald equation. And many labs are still using the, the Friedwald equation around the world. So this does get start to get into sort of my interest in technology because, because we were able to integrate our solution at Hopkins and Quest, um, that's great, but what about everybody else? And so we, we, I did work with the uh, Tech Innovation Center here and we built a mobile app that allows folks to just plug in your total cholesterol, HDL triglycerides, and you can calculate LDL by our method. And I knew, I, I was just emailing a couple days ago, the chair of the 2018 cholesterol guidelines at Northwestern, his lab still hasn't fully adopted this in their IT system. So even though they recommend it, he's not able to get it at his lab. So he still uses the mobile app, which is quite interesting. So this has provided a way to kind of scale up the solution throughout the world. And just to share briefly what the solution is, I don't wanna to linger too much because I wanna to get to the more to the mobile tech stuff. But basically what we found is that, that one, uh, the one size fits all approach that you, of, of the Friedwald method, that's right there in the middle of this table that we show. So truly the relationship of triglycerides to VLDL is not a one size fits all situation. That factor of five is the typical person truly does have a factor of five. But if you look across not the cholesterol levels and triglyceride levels, the, tr the factor really varies quite a bit. And so what we came up with is quite simple. It's just personalizing this equation based on someone's lipid profile. So we really account for the heterogeneity of triglycerides to VLDL, which ultimately is critical to the LDL calculation. And when we do this, it's not a perfect solution but it certainly improves things a lot. And so we go from a 40% concordance with the Friedwald method in the worst situation up to over 80% concordance. And what we've also found is that the Friedwald method gets even worse if somebody's not fasting. And these days, more and more patients are coming in. It's more convenient to get your lipid panel when you're not fasting. It might be, you know, that, that although it may, you know, sound kind of simple in a way, you know, this could be the difference between you see your doctor and then you go straight to the lab and get your results checked versus now you have to take off from work and come back another day to get your, your labs checked. And so what we found is that the Friedwald equation can have very large errors, um, particularly in the non-fasting state, whereas we're able to mostly resolve that with this approach so that we preserve the accuracy in LDL and more people could feel comfortable uh, tailoring treatments based on non-fasting results. And that was led by one of the Hopkins cardiology fellows, Basant Seth Um, So this is just the part of the reason I share this story is that this, this kind of opened my eyes to number one, challenging the status quo this Friedwald equation has been used for decades and everyone just sort of accepted it. And, and so, you know, this kind of led me to kind of think in that, that way to say, wait, could there be a better way? And number two, the thinking towards impact at scale. 
So to really, we did something at Hopkins, but we don't want to just keep it within the walls of Hopkins. We want to have the impact outside. And so it's been gratifying to see the, the method validated by many researchers around the world and to have, um, have the US guidelines, the AHA, ACC, NLA, to have European guidelines, Brazilian guidelines recommending this. But yet, even after those recommendations, it still might not be able to be implemented by the leader of the guideline. And so that's where sometimes creative mobile health solutions can be helpful. So I wanted to shift towards mobile health. And this was something I really started getting excited about, about midway in fellowship, and then has been a big focus of my faculty career. Um, and early on in the faculty, I joined this key opinion leader panel with HP and started to get to know Chris Gibbons from Hopkins through that uh, key opinion leader panel. And I know some of you will know Chris. And this was one of his publications. And really, I like this pie chart because it just provides such a high level kind of view on the future of medicine. I mean, the future so much when we go through medical training, so much of the focus is on in the hospital. All the rotations we do are in the hospital. There's a little bit outpatient and you kind of have the sense like that's what medicine is. But really, as Chris beautifully describes and, and shows that, you know, the future of care is largely out of the hospital, um, hospital at home, but mostly smart care communities and smart care. And, and he's been such a forward thinking uh, person as it comes to the integration of technology and, and communities. Um, so the, the research project that I did towards the end of fellowship was my first kind of venture into the use of technology to promote cardiovascular health. And here I had a specific focus on physical activity. Um, and David Feldman was a research assistant at the time. And as I'm going to kind of share as I go through some of our research, so much of what I've loved about my work is the, the mentees that I've gotten to work with and the way that they're going to drive forward this future that we all envision. And so David, um, I, got, I met him as a research assistant. Then he went to med school. Then he came to Hopkins for his residency. And now he's going to MGH for cardiology fellowship. They just had the match uh, today, which is super exciting. And so what we did was take patients in cardiology clinic who reported low levels of leisure time activity. And we worked with Hopkins med students at a time to build a technology intervention that combined a smartphone with a wearable to provide an automated coaching intervention. And what we, and Mike Blaha was my mentor at the time of, that I was working on this. And, and we were quite interested in not only what the effect of the kind of coaching messages would be, but also how much does it matter even just to see the step count numbers? So we created, it was a small uh, RCT. Um, and what we found was that, first of all, although everyone self-reported kind of lower levels of leisure time activity, just, can, uh, just those who agreed to participate in the trial, and we did have very um, high levels of participation, that they just going into the trial and the Hawthorne effect and so forth, there were high levels of achievement of this 10,000 step per day goal at baseline. That was more than we were expecting, but in retrospect, we probably should have predicted that. And then in phase one, we unblinded two thirds of the patients to actually see, see their step counts. And that didn't have much of an impact. Um, and, and then amongst that group that was unblinded, we then randomized to receive these personalized coaching messages. It would say things like Seth, like consider walking while you talk on a conference call or take, you know, parking further away or going on a walk. It, you know, we, we collected a lot of personal information, like the, the name of the patient's dog. And so suggest to go for a, a walk with the dog or with a spouse or, or so forth. We collected their favorite athlete. So we would use messages around their that athlete and so forth. And so what we saw was that there were 2000 steps more per day. So about a mile per day more of walking in the group that received those 
text messages. Now, the limitations of this it was a shorter trial. This was just a total of, of five to six weeks, um, but it was some indication of the promise. And one of the few randomized trials in this area that's been done, the blinded group just kind of continued to trend down over the course of the trial as that kind of initial activation weared off. What's been pretty cool, though, is that these initial results have been subsequently validated in pulmonary hypertension, in breast cancer survivors. There's ongoing testing in HIV patients and, and in the cardiac rehab setting. So just one of those papers was recently published. This was a collaboration we had with Vanderbilt. So they took this same approach. They tailored some of the messaging to the pulmonary hypertension setting. And they found that amongst 42 randomized patients, this was funded by an NIH R34, so it was a smaller study in preparation for a larger grant, the change in steps from baseline to week 12 was higher in the intervention group. The, the total magnitude was a little lower than we saw, but still there was a significant difference between the intervention group and the control. And they also saw some interesting uh, other clinical improvements like in visceral fat volume. So it was around the time that I was getting interested in mobile health, working on the M-Active trial that I found out about this NIH M-Health Training Institute. And so I went out to UCLA for a week. Here I am right there. Um, and we were all kind of squinting in the sun for this picture. But what the, what I really gleaned from this institute at a high level was that I was too much in a bubble um, at the time. Like I, I needed to branch out more. There were so many more disciplines of people working around the world at our university that I was not inter interacting with. I first started learning like the, 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 that there were people that actually focused their attention on human-centered design. Uh, at this particular conference. And so as I came back from that, that was around the time that I had the fortune of, I was working with a great medical student, Jane Wang, and had the fortune of meeting Francoise Marvel, who was an intern at the time at, at Johns Hopkins Bayview. And Francoise was in the Hexite Accelerator Program at the Tech uh, Center at Hopkins and, and starting to enter to this, into this uh, space and starting to build a multidisciplinary team. And so that was exactly kind of what I was feeling inspired to do coming back from that M Health Institute. And so it's just been a tremendous journey since then working with Francoise. And I'm gonna focus quite a bit on our work and the other, others that have played key roles along the way in, in, building, in building this. And so what, what I wanted to do as well was to go beyond physical activity. I was feeling like excited by what we did with the MActive trial, but feeling like, you know, cardiovascular health is such a bigger picture than that. And can we think bigger and address this in a more comprehensive way? So ultimately, this journey kind of led us to, to publish a lot, a lot of papers over the years, but this is uh, one of them uh, where we give our uh, toolkit to navigate from concept to clinical testing, really starting with the clinical problem or the public health problem and, um, uh, and going from there. So um, uh, let's see, sorry, just getting a thing to prove some. Okay, so uh, does T Tevion Kinsey, do you need, it's asking me to give you uh, control. Do you need some sort of control? Nope. Don't okay. give control. Okay. Don't give control. Okay. Yeah, I've declined. Keep the So. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So this is the the roadmap, and you know, there's just key aspects. We're building the multidisciplinary team, and 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 looking for opportunities to accelerate. I'm going to share some of our collaboration with Apple that's accelerated us. Um, I don't need to tell you all any of this, but you know, you know the, the critical importance of engaging with caregiver feedback and, and so forth. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now share a video. This is put together by Apple for their most recent Worldwide Developer Conference, but it, it can kind of quick, in a quick video, share, um, I'm still getting those requests. I'm going to decline again, but we can... Um, we can, it, is Tavion Kinsey um, part of our 
group. I keep getting, uh, this no, is like. No, I don't, don't give control. I'm not yeah. really sure what's going on, but we'll, yeah. we'll take care of it. Yeah, I'm just going to keep declining, but maybe we can boot this. Nico, can you, can you help with that? Yeah, I, I did. I asked Nico already. Okay. Thank you. I just Thank you. Yep. I feel like this might be the negative part of Twitter sometimes. Um, yeah. So, so uh, I'm going to share this video. This number one highlights how inspiring and articulate Francoise is. Uh, it also just gives you a glimpse kind of into the thinking of what we're doing with the Cori app. And this leads to a lot of the momentum that we have in the HA in the HA Center. And it also gives a glimpse into our, to our collaboration with Apple, which I think is is one of the key ingredients to sort of the success, the teamwork, bringing their design um, expertise. Um, and, and what's cool about this is it, it's again getting, although we have it's getting to the idea of scale that we're kind of getting this this idea of what's happening at Hopkins out to a lot more people. So let's go to the video. <laughs> and the well-being of your family is always important to you, and never more so than this past year. Apple's commitment to health is stronger than ever. We're collaborating with medical experts to accelerate health innovation, and we're empowering individuals to improve their health, as well as make it easier for them to participate in large-scale research studies. With our APIs, developers are using our devices and health app to come up with ingenious ways to push things forward. Here's an example. I'm Francoise Marble. I'm a cardiology fellow at Johns Hopkins. Seth Martin, I'm also a cardiologist at Johns Hopkins. Seth and I spend our days alongside our patients at the bedside. You know, six white coats hovering over a bed, and we're trying to actually share what the patient's condition is, how they need to improve their life. We use medical jargon, we speak quickly, we confuse patients, and they're left on their own. There has to be a better way than just treating a patient, handing them a bunch of papers, and expecting that they're going to understand how to change their life. We thought, well, what if we completely re-engineer the process for a heart attack patient? by using research kit, care kit, health kit, and then connecting it with an Apple Watch so we can bring in key cardiovascular metrics that help us to know patients are doing well. When Francoise was in the technology accelerator program at Hopkins, the work there led to this phone call with Apple. And towards the end of the phone call, Francoise said to Divya at Apple, what can we do to accelerate this? And Divya said, you guys got to come out to Cupertino. Let's turn your vision into reality. And we had a Silicon Valley Airbnb, and we started side by side coding with our iOS developers. And then every couple hours, we would talk about their vision and the tools they could leverage. We go to a whiteboard and we lay out, here are the things you guys should go tackle. And we go back to our Airbnb, pour more coffee, you know, order some bubble teas, eat some food, and then we would go into Cupertino. They'd come back into Cupertino, piled in a minivan, and spend like almost a full day there getting more feedback, working with their teams, and then they would leave our offices and work through the night building and implementing the things we had talked about. With our tools and their vision, we ultimately made something together. We left Cupertino invigorated and guess what our clinical trial was able to save an incredible amount of people from having complications and come back to the hospital and it reduced hospital readmissions by 52 percent and likely saved a lot of lives i remember we were just sitting outside beautiful cupertino weather and it was just one of those moments where it dawned on us that Corey app was going to have an impact on so many people's hearts around the world this is the start of something incredible it's the spark and now it's like Fire. This is just one of the many inspiring stories out there and is a testament to the innovative work happening in the medical community. So uh, it's been amazing to work with Francoise. I think the Center for Health Equity is going to be critical to us, uh, that, that spark really lighting the fire and us really blowing this up where I think it can go. It, this was in an early sketch by Francoise, and it's just amazing sort of through collaboration with Apple, through collaboration with engineers at Hopkins, led by Matthias Lee, what we've been able to, to build, a really a personalized, holistic uh, experience to engage patients in 
what we know works to prevent heart attacks and strokes, taking your medications, understanding your blood pressure, really, really understanding what's going on with your health and connecting with clinicians. Um, the scientific result that Francoise mentioned of a 50% reduction uh, in our MyCor trial that was recently published in Circ Outcomes, Aaron Spalding, who's now a postdoc, uh, played, a, and, and some of you know, played a key role in this trial. Aaron was absolutely essential. We couldn't have done this without Aaron. She was on the front lines enrolling all the patients into this trial. Matthias Lee was the lead of our engineering team. And I think part of you know, what we have is we, we have a, a family of folks that have come together now for five plus years working together to incorporate patient feedback to make this a solution that really can serve the needs of our patients. Um, I'm going to go at a quick kind of pace here to make sure that, that, I, that I don't go way over time, but th these were the high level results from the MyCore trial. So we enrolled 200 heart attack patients at Hopkins, Harvard, Reading Hospital through the Hopkins Clinical Research Network. And this was the, the, the much better uh, readmission outcome that we saw. And readmission sounds sometimes very administrative and medical, but you know, this means people being at home for the holidays. This means life and death you know, for, for families. And so that we, we were just, this was better than we could ever imagine. And we think this was driven by very high levels of patient engagement, activation. It was very unique that we were giving a smartphone based Apple, Apple Watch integrated solution to a patient who was in the CCU at, at the hospital. You know, many people thought this was a bit crazy to be doing, but we found a very diverse population engaging with this type of approach. And we recently published in medical care, really encouraging findings from a cost standpoint. These patients all gave permission to share their pictures. These are some of the patients from the MyCore trial. Uh, this particular patient came into clinic with her Cori bag and the doctor that saw her then texted Francoise about just how thrilled she was to have such an engaged patient coming to see her. Uh, we had young and old patients, patients of all sorts joining this trial, look, starting to watch videos on their smartphone there in the hospital wearing an Apple Watch. Uh, one of the patients we did co-publish her story in BMJ case reports, her name is Tammy, and she uh, was someone who really didn't use much technology before her heart attack. And when she was in the hospital, she said that she was feeling alone, confused. She wasn't understanding half of what the medical team was saying. And she then connected with Corey, binge watched the educational videos. She was then asking questions of her team on rounds more engaged in her care. She started tracking on her Apple Watch her steps as she did laps around the nursing station. She really overhauled her cardiovascular health and, and lost a bunch of weight and improved um, her, her, her quality of life. And she got uh, promoted to a new manager position at her job at Walmart. Here she is pictured with Francoise after that promotion. She's become one of our super users who even after a couple of years after being discharged from the heart attack, continued to use Corey long-term and felt it was really critical as a technology, but also as a program. And so this kind of line of work is really what I think has led me um, to, to today and leads to us getting funding for this Hopkins Center for, for Mobile Technologies to achieve equity in cardiovascular health. This is our, our logo. We view the colors here as diversity. We view the, the circles here as from kind of a top-down view as like a team working together, collaborating together, clinicians and patients, engineers and researchers and, and so forth. And of course it has a heart shape, but also has some neurons uh, given we have collaborations with uh, David Newman Toker and the, the neurology group. We're really trying to bring together science with entrepreneurism to, to scale up um, our impact through shared values of, of health equity, patient outcomes, and global impact. These are the core principles of our center. Equity first, complete solutions, strengthen teamwork, and impact at scale. And I think you've already heard me start to, to share some of those themes. 
This slide is credit to Dr. Ivan Commodore Mensa, and uh, I've already been learning, you know, from Dr. Commodore Mensa and, and others what equity first really, really means. And we're we're striving through mobile technology to really provide a tailored solution that can level the playing field and give every person an opportunity to achieve optimal health, regardless of all these factors. This is our incredibly uh, talented, diverse team that's driving forward all this work. I'm going to highlight some of these people, including, uh, I've already highlighted Francoise, I'm going to highlight uh, Nino in just a moment, as well as others. Um, but we really are looking towards the smartphone to help bridge the, the, the digital divide. Um, and I'm going to get briefly in, into that. But if these are data from the Pew Center, and I think many people will already be familiar with this. This is, again, a slide that uh, Yvonne had put together for one of our HA presentations. And there's just such wide adoption of smartphones, and it's just growing. And as we look at the use of smartphones to search for health information, we see that the numbers are, are, are high and getting higher, and particularly among Black and Hispanic populations. Wearables, I think, you know, could be a big part of the solution in the future. Obviously, we integrated a smartwatch in our in our prior work. I'm not going to get deep into that, but for there, there's so many kind of opportunities here in the cardiovascular space, and this was nicely summarized in an article that Mohammed El Shazli recently was a senior author on that several of us collaborated on. He was I'm very proud of him because he was the first Osler resident who I who I ever mentored. Um, and he's just doing fantastically well. Um, so when it comes to access to technology in patients at risk or with cardiovascular disease, we're seeing, again, e even if you focus not just on the general population, but those with cardiovascular disease or risk, there's a lot of smartphone ownership. But then as you start to look at how much it's being used for health purposes to track health, make health decisions, when interacting with clinicians, the numbers are still a lot smaller. I think there's still a lot of opportunity here. Part of it's going to be creating a warm culture in the clinical environment that we invite data and in, in the use of this. This is a key article that just came out in JMIR uh, by Uchenna and mentored by Yvonne Commodore Mensa. And so this was focused on the National Health Interview Survey, looking at health IT use in patients with self-reported ASCVD. And so what was found is that adults with ASCVD are less likely to use health IT than those without. So it's 25 or 50%. And among adults with prior ASCVD, social determinants that were associated with use included younger age, higher education, higher income, being employed and being married. And so this paper speaks to the need for targeted strategies and, and policies to eliminate barriers to health IT usage. And these data from the MESA study further reinforce this need for targeted strategies. This was led by one of the Hopkins undergraduates, Reshmi Patel, and she recently presented this at AHA. And she finds uh, many disparities across internet access, computing device ownership, fitness tracker ownership, um, by factors like age, but also race, ethnicity, income, education, and, and so forth. Um, one of the strategies we're taking to address access was a loaner program that we created. So we created this iShare program to loan out iPhones, and this would allow half of the patients that participated in our MyCore trial did so through this program. It turned out to be much more complex than I ever could have imagined to, to develop a loaner program, but we're thankful to have William Yang lead this effort to develop all the um, components of this to do this in a consistent, reliable way. And so this work with the, the Cori uh, uh, program really led, as I mentioned, to the momentum coming into this HA SFRN. And a goal that we had as, as our group brainstormed around what that center would look like was really to be more complete and from spanning diagnosis to treatment. And so today I'm mainly focusing on this side. Uh, David Newman Toker and, and, and team are doing amazing things in diagnosis um, to close gaps. And, and as I highlighted, there's need for, for closing gaps in areas like familial hypercholesterolemia. 
Uh, but what I'm gonna focus in on is, is AIM-2 here. But just to give a shout out to the, our AIM-1 team and our center, they've developed a <clears throat> novel technology that can analyze eye movements and they've traditionally done it through goggles to be able to diagnose strokes that otherwise would be missed. And they're now taking that technology to the iPhone to make it cheaper and more scalable to be used throughout the, the country and around the world. But I wanna, as I get sort of towards the, the, the later chapter of, of this, I wanted to just dial in on what we're doing in the AIM-2 side of our center, which is focused on cardiac rehab. So I, I, this is just a, a major area that I would love to, to brainstorm together with. We're doing so much thinking and, and putting so much effort into trying to build a future where everyone can access cardiac rehab services because it's such a beautiful way to organize everything that we know works to protect against heart attacks and strokes and bad cardiovascular outcomes. So there's major challenges here. Few uh, programs serve rural and low-income communities. And even right now, only it's commonly said that about 20% of people that are eligible participate in cardiac rehab. But even if we filled up, even in the best case scenario that we filled up all of the existing centers, still only about a third of patients who are eligible would be able to participate. And there's heterogeneity across centers, which can you know, affect the quality of the care delivered. And then on the patient side of things, there's time cost to travel to the centers, taking off time from work, patient schedules may just not align with the Monday through Friday, nine to five schedule of the center. There's financial costs of the co-payments from insurance, parking fees and, and so forth. And in, in addition, the digital solutions that have been attempted so far to date as, as led by Shannon, uh, one of the Hopkins medical students, have really just been narrow. It's been only on the physical activity component of cardiac rehab, whereas cardiac rehab is supposed to deliver a more comprehensive solution addressing things like blood pressure and cholesterol. So um, this is a picture of you, Nancy. I hope you're okay with, with me including this. You're at the AHA office locally in, in Baltimore, and you've been a great inspiration to Nino and myself and, and the whole team. Um, Human-centered design has been, as we think about the solution to cardiac rehab, and knowing that this is such a big, complex problem, we're not going to solve it just by all going to sit in a room together. We need to bring patients and other key stakeholders into this. And thinking back to Apple, this is similar to the way Apple thinks. You start with the whoever you're trying to serve, with the customer, and then you work back to the technology. You don't just take technology and try to put it here, put it there, you, you got to start with understanding what the need is. And you and Nino are doing an amazing job building this inclusive human-centered design framework. And I understand there's a manuscript in development that's looking really good, and I can't wait to read it and, and learn from both of you. Uh, this is a very exciting direction. I think I've been humbled that uh, there's still a lot of opportunity to kind of form the frameworks here that a lot of it's kind of many people are doing it many different ways. And some of this is done differently within the technology industry than within the walls of academia and kind of bringing the best of the best together is going to be critical to robust scalable uh, building robust scalable solutions. So as I just share some of the emerging insights from human-centered design sessions that, that Nancy and, and Nino and team have led, um, we hear from clinicians that organizing a wealth of info for patients and delivering in a way that's not overwhelming is really important. We hear that access is really important. This is from Angela Street, one of the cardiology NPs. She said, we look all over to find cardiac rehab for patients we're lucky to find a program, but have no way of contacting the program to ensure that patients followed up. We have patients saying that right now you find too much information on the internet. So how do you handle that? Because some is misinformation, some is right information. How do you judge? What can I trust? Which one I don't even want to take a look. Still, I think that's a big issue um, is, some, is the concern over taking medications and then getting on an exercise routine during the pandemic because I'm not an exercise, on an exercise routine and that's a problem that I need to solve. 
So some of the themes emerging are the access issues, the need for a tailored program, not a one size fits all approach, education, education, education for patients, clinicians. Um, if it's okay, I'm gonna share one more video and then I'll go quickly and wrap up and, and get, we can get to our discussion. So I wanted to share kind of where we are with the virtual cardiac rehab solution. We're continuing to iterate with uh, the output of human centered design sessions, with the in, uh, with everything that's coming from our patients and the and the clinicians and the team. So, with the equity first perspective of our center, we're really trying to make it easy to get onboarded to technology and also to address social determinants of health as we uh, onboard patients. Make it easy to connect blood pressure devices so that patients can get this key metric as part of their overall cardiovascular care. Teaching patients how to wear it properly so that we can get the readings to best inform clinical practice. We started with Apple, we branched out to Android and Fitbit to make this even more scalable to all types of patients. Patients can interact both on their watch or on the smartphone. Easily get metrics like heart rate, which then stream to the Cori app. Exercise has now become a, a, a bigger focus for us as we scale up virtual cardiac rehab. These are some of the amazing patients who you saw a picture of earlier. And I mentioned that we've developed this loaning program we also provide these prepaid data uh, plans. And we've had an impressive return rate of equipment so that we can make it more efficient and cheaper at scale. Um, education, education, education. This keeps coming up in the groups. And we started with a certain vendor and then later migrated to another vendor where we have these shorter, more engaging, visually impactful educational videos like on the artery plaque and cholesterol and have it in English and Spanish. And this educational piece is something that we're continuing to try to make better and better. So with M Active, I was focused on physical activity alone and particularly step counts. And, and with what we're trying to do here, we're trying to build out this fuller experience that includes total step counts, but also the, the actual exercise sessions and build in coaching, including workout videos from the HA, but also from Apple Fitness, um, which is uh, a great program that, that has developed tailored videos, for example, for the geriatric population. Cardiac rehab really is about a more complete solution beyond exercise, also addressing diet, nutrition, weight loss information. If somebody's a smoker, helping them quit smoking, getting them to 1-800, quit now. Diabetes management, lipid management, giving education, but also other resources like the lipid clinic to help get the cholesterol under control, like happened in the case of TA, like I mentioned. We're, the human center design sessions are leading us to make different changes to the app to make it more usable for our patients. As patients finish uh, their educational content, they have a heart filling up with gold. We try to gamify the app as much as possible to engage patients. Although the MyCore results were focused really exclusively on self-management, we're now building out more of a dashboard for clinicians. And so here we have medication adherence, education. The clinician can see what the patient's completed and then that can help provide personalized coaching as time goes on. So teamwork is absolutely essential. For sake of time, I'm actually gonna jump ahead, but because um, uh, I wanna make sure I preserve enough time for discussion. So I wanted to give a shout out uh, to this amazing book, which is now essential reading for our MTech Center. Uh, Lisa, you say that novel technologies have enormous potential to promote health equity, both in developed countries like the US and around the world. And the use of innovative technologies also makes it possible to involve underserved communities at all stages of design, implementation, and evaluation of interventions. And I just don't think that happens enough, but I'm so 
grateful to be part of a team that's actually trying to do that through the MTech Center. This is where we are in about midway through the second year. Our schedule kind of runs spring to spring. So we've been focused on design and engineering, trial planning led by Nino and uh, now Lena Matthews. And then we're going to be launching our trial this coming spring. Uh, as I mentioned, our MTech rehab trial will be led uh, by Nino and Lena Matthews. We're going to enroll about 400 patients who are eligible for cardiac rehab. Given the safety issues, we do have to exclude people who are high risk by guideline criteria, and they'll be randomized to a control arm of usual care versus, a, versus this uh, virtual cardiac rehab solution, followed up for 12 weeks with a primary outcome. This is still under active debate and actually will benefit from hopefully further input from patients, including um, stakeholders from the community advisory board that you all have built over so many years. Um, but at the moment, we're thinking of primary outcomes, including participation, but we feel like we need to go beyond just participation and show something clinical. Um, at the moment, we really like LDL cholesterol as a possible uh, outcome, uh, but there's still a lot of debate around other possible outcomes. But this really does integrate a lot of what a cardiac rehab accomplishes. This is hot off the press. It's supposed to be online today. I'm not sure if, if it's fully out there yet, but this was led by Kellen Knowles, um, who was a Hopkins med student, and Helen Zun, who was a Hopkins med student. Kellen has gone on to become a chief resident, and I just found out the good news today that he matched at Hopkins for cardiology fellowship. So we welcome Kellen to our fellowship. He is leading us in thinking about how to support caregivers of heart patients, how to engage the family I'm sure there's some of you out there um, in the group right now who can also help teach us about that. We're trying to advocate in terms of access and closing the digital divide. Uh, I did write a letter together with the Maryland Department of Health advocating for greater access to blood pressure monitors. We sent that to Medicaid. Um, and then in terms of cardiac rehab access, we, um, I share this link. Um, a number of our team members have used this link and you can quickly send a letter advocating for legislation that's gonna help increase access to cardiac rehab by allowing for a, a non-physician oversight. We're collaborating with CDC. They have a research work group, a health equity uh, work group. For sake of time, I'm just gonna keep moving along. Uh, this, this HA network has just been a great opportunity for collaboration. And I'll mention there is an uh, emerging project in the heart failure space that Aaron Spalding is leading. Uh, I wanted to thank you all, uh, Yvonne and team for involving me in the linked BP study. I don't really need to say more because you all know what that's all about. And, uh, but I just wanted to thank you for that. It's been a pleasure to collaborate with Yvonne in multiple respects, including on the HA stats document so our 2022 report is in press. Uh, and what I mentioned this at the beginning, what's new is that we have formed a health equity work group that Yvonne is serving on. Um, and there will be a new introduction to the statistics document focused on health equity. We're using new search terms to guide the literature search of each of the chapters in the stats document. And we're also gonna be co-publishing a viewpoint article uh, further illuminating uh, aspects of, of health equity with the stats report. It's been on a personal note, just a pleasure to get to know Yvonne, here she is, and myself and other team members at the HA uh, Heart Walk. And so in summary, um, and sorry for not finishing a little bit earlier, but in, in summary, there are major disparities in diagnosis and, and treatment prevention, uh, treatment and prevention, secondary prevention and primary prevention contributing to the global burden of cardiovascular disease. And I shared familial hypercholesterolemia as just such a striking example. Here it is staring us in the face, LDL levels of 300, cholesterol showing up in your eyes, having multiple heart attacks, and it's still not getting diagnosed and properly treated. And this experience with LDL cholesterol underestimation contributing to undertreatment really taught me that um, we have the potential to scale up solutions through mobile apps. And, and it really taught me to challenge the status quo and to aim for that impact at scale. 
the, there's such a promise of bold new mobile health technology approaches for promoting health equity, but it's not going to be as simple as just downloading an app that's in the app store. There's so much to this and we need to engage patients, key stakeholders in the design, development and testing. And there's truly a digital divide that must be addressed at the policy level, payer level, health system uh, level and, and patient level. And our loaner program and other efforts are really just a step in the right direction, but not anywhere close to solving this. Um, trainees are, and this may be the most important point that I share today, that I, I tried to highlight some of the amazing trainees and, and trainees are excited by technology. And I really think this is an opportunity to recruit more and more diverse and talented trainees to the, to the mission. So sorry for going a little bit of overtime, but thank you so much for the opportunity to connect. And I uh, am going to stop sharing my slides and excited to hear what people have to say. Bravo. Uh, thank you so much, Seth. This was really so inspirational and very um, enlightening and just exciting, frankly. So thank you so much. Um, I don't know if folks have hands up because they want to ask questions. I know one thing, you can definitely design any slides I make um, <laughs> for any presentations. <laughs> um, but no, really, um, from, the, from the personal stories of the patients and the study participants to like the stories of collegiality and just teamwork, um, plus just like the inspiring kind of innovation of all these different um, technologies and how they, they're really being used to change lives. This has just been really amazing. Um, even for me who um, I've actually been kind of a skeptic of technology and how, how much, you know, it can actually be used. I, I'm, you know, it's like time to get on board because it's here and we might as well use it for good. Um, it's being used for all kinds of other things, but it's people like you that actually um, are make, using technology and using your smarts and to really connect with people and to really like bring about good change. So thank you. Thank um, you so uh, oh, I only had one question since I'm, I have the prerogative of being uh, the moderator here is, have you all spoken with or connected with the program Noom at all? I'm just wondering, because I know that has taken off so well right. in terms of its success on with a weight loss strategy. So I'm just wondering right. about that. We, no, that's a good point. We have not, but I, I mean, it comes up more and more. We just, lit yesterday, uh, the Princess Brewer and I were on a meeting with one of our colleagues from UCSF putting together this PCORI grant to try to bring centers together around virtual cardiac rehab. And one of our collaborators mentioned that she gained weight during the pandemic and used Noom and found it su successful. And it's come up again and again. Obviously, they've done well as a company and sound, I've heard good experiences. So I don't know, I'll, I'll take mental note. And for the folks that I work with, let's take mental note. We should probably like reach out to Noom and see, see what they're, you know, I think that, that I, it's, it's very impressive. And, and we, that's, you know, that's been our model to, to really try to reach outside the, the university walls and see what other people are doing. We don't want to, if someone is doing weight loss really, really well, we don't need to reinvent the wheel there. Let's just try to partner. Right, right. I see Nico um, Dominguez Carrero. Um, oh, let's see what's going on. And if anybody is connected with Noom already, uh, please let us know. Okay. Oh, yeah. So he was basically thanking you for your incredible and inspirational presentation and asking, how do you ensure accessibility and equitable HIT for older ethnic adults who are not tech savvy or those who aren't English proficient? Yeah, well, it, it feels like maybe there's multiple layers to that. I, I guess from an older adult standpoint, um, we like, first of all, I've seen a lot of studies set upper age limits to their study. And I, I've had trouble understanding that. We, we had no upper age limit to our MyCore trial. I think the oldest person, Erin Spalding can correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was like about 88. Um, and I think she was like a woman who had just gotten an iPhone as a gift or something like a couple weeks prior to her heart attack. Um, in our experience, just to generalize a little bit, I mean, often the older adults 
although they may take more help at first, and that help might come from our team, but it also comes from family members. Once they get going, they tend to be like really good at using the app and sometimes more reliable than, than the younger patients. So, um, so I, I guess our approach has been not to like judge anyone ahead of time, like give everybody a chance because it's, it's quite impressive at what the older population can, can do. And um, I, I think um, when it comes to the race ethnicity question, I mean, I, 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 I think there, especially in Baltimore, maybe there all are like, there's probably multiple layers here, but there's trust issues, you know, part of, and part of what we're trying to do is like, is get, um, is get at that from, first of all, reassuring people that we have very tight, like privacy security pieces in place. Uh, but also, I think like what could help with this in the future is as we have kind of alumni of our program, and it's sort of like a patient that you can identify more with in terms of, you know, your background, that, that those patients could also become coaches on our program. Um, but we, I mean, we, we had a pretty good diverse group in my core, but we can do even better moving forward. That sounds great. Um, oh, just to clarify, that question did come yeah. from Camila. Ben Saudi, Ben Saud. Okay. okay. And then um, let's see, one from Arlene Dawson. Does what does your app use for a food data tracking base? Yeah. Uh, I mean, at the time that we were starting this, like I was working with Under Armour. They bought my Fitness Pal. I mean, there was there we could have gone very deep into the diet tracking kind of side of this, but we were trying to accomplish a lot here and sort of between patient feedback and our own and sort of the team's consensus, we decided not to overly complicate the diet side of things. And so we provided education, uh, but we did not make like diet tracking a key feature of the app. But certainly there, I, I, I'm sure there's people who would have wanted that um, and we didn't have it. And so that that is a future direction. I know there's people at Hopkins that are working in that space. Again, Noom could be great to work with. Under Armour just, just sold off my fitness pal, but, um, but I think that, that that's an area that where we could do better and better. So at the moment, we just focus on, on education, but not emphasize tracking. Okay, right. Sounds good. Um, and one, one kind of concept that we've had is like focus on the actions, because we could turn the app into collecting a million data points, but then again, you overwhelm someone and they don't even take the actions that you need. So we've always focused more on action than on like what data we can collect. That, that's a good point. So Chidama, you had typed a question into the um, chat box. Do you wanna go ahead and ask it? Sure, thanks for letting me ask. And this was such a great um, pre presentation. It was so inspiring and one of the things I really loved about it is that you could really see how all of the different collaborators you've worked with have really, you've allowed them to transform your research program. And, and I find that really inspiring. But the other thing that really struck me was you've done such a great job of engaging with major corporations. And um, you don't really see that very often, not in academia. And I was just wondering, what advice you have for your colleagues who may be interested in forging partnerships with an Apple or a Google or whomever um, in support of community engaged research that is health equity focused? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I, I, I think back to like a moment when I was a cardiology fellow and I had a conversation with Mike Blaha in the hallway and we were both starting to like have some interest of industry people kind of working with us. And we talked about it and we decided like, you need to do that. You need to go beyond the walls of Hopkins. And we just decided to embrace it. Both he and I have embraced it. And we've had a lot of industry collaboration over the years. We had models kind of before us of people in academia who just shunned off any collaborations at all. And that is the typical academic model. But we decided to just kind of kind of go for it. And I'm so glad that I did because I, I feel like I've been shaped a lot, like not, not only the resources that they bring and what they teach us, but 
shaped a lot by, by like what there's, there are a lot of smart people working at Apple, Google and industry. And we learn a lot from them, you know, Nino and Aaron and others have been part of these design sessions that we do with Apple. And I like, I just don't know, we could find someone at Hopkins to go through every, you know, font size and type of font and placement of every button at the level that they go into it. It's just mind blowing. So I think we need to embrace these collaborations. Then we need to just be super transparent about, about it all. But I just think it's part of the equation to success here, we, to, to be successful outside of Hopkins. So I guess I don't really have any advice other than embrace it. And if you get offered a phone call like we did, um, then take that phone call and plan the next step to like meet each other in person if you can and so forth. So. I think that's so great, great advice. Yeah. One thing I will add uh, to that is that I think it's a lot like engaging with other stakeholders is building relationships and, you know, and, and persevering and being in it for the long haul and identifying common ground. So uh, that's what, anyway, I haven't done as much as you have with that, but in my short experience in doing that, that's what I found to be helpful. Um, so there's another question from, uh, Lucine Francis um, asking if you have any recommendations for a social determinants of health screening tools and are you using one in the app? In, and if you are using a screening tool and what, what are some of the ways the app addresses adverse social determinants right. of health? Yeah, great question. And by the way, Lucine has exciting work that she's planning and I appreciate Lucine you involving me in your K plans. And I'd also say that I'm not an expert on social terms of health. There's many more people here that would be able to speak to this better. Um, we initially had just a few simple questions, you know, do you need help with transportation and, and so forth, pain, you know, help paying for medications. But recently Avon taught me, I think it's called the prepare tool is like a very well validated tool. So, I, I mean, I just learned that like a couple weeks ago and that's something that I've, I've already shared that with our team and we're looking at like doing this in a more formal way. So I don't know, prepare is what I'm aware of thanks to Yvonne. And that is an excellent tool. Are there any burning questions? We have two minutes to, to spare. It's been a real exciting time so far. If there are any burning questions, time in. Thank you everybody for all the questions and the really nice comments in the chat. This has been amazing. We look forward to more uh, exciting collaborations with you and uh, to having you, of course, come back and to having our trainees interact with you. Um, so it's been, it's been wonderful. And um, if there's nothing, no other questions, what I'll do is is wish everyone a happy and peaceful and healthy holiday season and say thank you all for joining us and, and look forward to having you all back in the new year. Um, when we have, we'll have another exciting lineup. I haven't, um, I think our speaker for January is gonna be Dr. Monica Peake, who is from the University of Chicago, for those of you who don't know her. She's a, a, a health equity researcher with expertise in community engaged interventions to address diabetes and also uh, breast cancer. But uh, you know, stay stay in touch with us, write us, reach out to us, let us know of any interesting speakers or topics you'd like to hear about. And again, we we look forward to engaging with you. And thank you again to Dr. Seth Martin and to our amazing. Center for Health Equity team who helps to make this go so smoothly. Um, we have Nico Dominguez Carrero. We have um, our just all of our amazing staff uh, and associate directors and program director, many of whom Seth gave a lot of credit to. So thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Seth. Bye. Have a great night.